Secretary of Natural Resources Agency. I believe we saw um, uh, Ms. Sulier. I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry about Brian that. Cash Secretary here. of um, Natural Resources. Sorry, Brian. Brian Dash here for Wade Grove. Excellent. Apologize. Uh, Secretary of California Health and Human Services. Hi there, Julie Sulier, Assistant Secretary with CalHHS, and for uh, Secretary Mark Galley. Excellent. Thank you so much, Julie. Secretary of Transportation. Lori Pepper and here for Secretary of Ashokan. Thank you. Secretary of the Natural Resources Agency. Oh, sorry, excuse me, Brian. Um, Secretary of Business, Consumer Services, and Housing. Hi, Erica Gonzalez here on behalf of Secretary Castro Ramirez. Thank you. Uh, speaker of the Assembly appointee representing the interests of private businesses. I do believe I saw Lupita on the on the call. Okay, Lupita will be joining us back after an um, a, a prior a prior engagement. Um, <clears throat> Governor's appointee representing the utilities industry. This is Adam Wright, President. Welcome to the board. Thank you. Send the, send the committee on rules appointee representing county governments. Afternoon, uh, Jeff Tony, County of San Diego for Holly Porter. Thank you. Chancellor of the California State University. President of the University of California. Hi, this is Amina Safa representing President Michael Drake. Excellent, thank you all. Uh, we do have a quorum. Uh, Chief Deputy Director Curry, would you like to provide any opening remarks? Nice to um, see all of you on our new world of hybrid environment. Um, it extends to extends to this, so we appreciate participation. Important project. So, uh, Director Gilarducci apologizes. Um, was unexpectedly unable to um, to attend today, so he asked me to to fill in. I'm happy to do. And just in opening, we have not met since um, since October, so it's been a little while. So we've got a full agenda of updates for you um, of uh, positive progress on a lot of fronts. So we're really excited to get into the dialogue and uh, welcome to Adam, who's a new member um, representing the utilities industry for PG&E. So, um, so maybe uh, he can say a few words at some point in the, in the meeting to welcome you to this group and contributions. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we've got um, updates across the board with system ops, um, exciting news on the build out that has progressed tremendously in California, uh, research and development, and, um, you know, 50 some alerts now have been issued in, in California. So a lot of this is being in real time um, in real events. Um, so our public is getting more used to this. and. Um, I just want to thank all the partners who, um, when you harken back to when we started this, that have, have just really figured out how to make this real in our state and, and beyond. Um, it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of new territory, but um, all that's possible because of all of your input, especially from. from um, we've also got some exciting news on budget and, uh, but really hope to spend a good time, a good part of this meeting hearing from you. Um, really envisioning this next juncture of how we can get this technology, this system um, better embedded into our business, our industry, um, and all the things that are important to California in addition to the public uptake through cell phones and, and automated alerts. So, um, you know, that, that will be uh, something we hope to walk away from today to really have some brainstorming and a roadmap of what 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 that will take because it occurs to us that we have to um, you know industry needs to understand how this is a benefit and, and we've got to do the work to to help the, help bridge that understanding 
and also, you know, there may be new technology that has yet to, um, to materialize that, that enables us to use EW. So we know all those things, um, but we want to make sure that you, you know, want to apply our efforts at Cal OES to uh, really, um, um, you know, kind of a, Oh, and I failed to, to mention we have part two. So again, thank you to board members for being here. Thank you to all our partners. You can't see them off on camera, but we've got we've got a lot of our subject experts and, and partner agencies here in the room. And we just look forward to the updates and the dialogue. So back to you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Adam, I'm not sure if you want to take a second to introduce yourself. Um, before um, I open it up to the rest of the advisory board members. Sure, yeah, happy to. So Adam Wright, I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President for Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Moved to California about a year and a half ago. I'm from the Midwest, and so earthquakes are a new phenomenon for me. Um, I've experienced a couple of small ones already since I've been here, but very, very happy to represent the utility industry um, on this advisory board, the utility industry obviously is a very important part of the economic and other infrastructure of this state and of this uh, nation. And so our response and ability to partner to help people prepare for these types of emergencies is just critical and foundational to um, our business model and why we exist. So happy to be here and looking forward to contributing. Thank you, Adam. Would any other advisory board members um, in the room or virtually like to make any opening remarks? <laughs> Hearing none, um, we'll move right on to review and approve the, the meeting minutes from the previous meeting. So there is a copy of the meeting minutes in um, everyone's packet, whether you received it virtually or in person. Please take a few minutes uh, to review them. Um, and if any, if there's any changes that should be made, um, well, let us know. So any changes from anybody on the board? Remember, if you're virtual, uh, you may have to unmute yourself. I'll move approval. Okay, hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, excellent, do we have a second? Second. Excellent, uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Hi. Excellent. Motion passes. With that, we'll discuss the general program updates, which will be covered by yours truly here. Let me make sure that we queue it up. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> so it's been about eight months since we last met uh, with the advisory board, and a lot of exciting changes have occurred. The first and, and definitely most important to me um, is that we are once again fully staffed as of June 1st, 2022. We did have some vacancies in program um, for a bit there. Um, and obviously that was um, of, of a, a, a big priority for us. And I can you know, truly say that was a, the, the, the biggest priority and we were able to backfill you know, fairly quickly, not just with my current position, but all the way down the line. Um, to the rest of the team. Uh, we're very excited about the team. They've hit the ground running um, and you're gonna get to see some of the exciting work that they've actually worked on in the last eight months. Um, <clears throat> well, we'll move right along to the 2022 business plan. We wanna thank the board and particularly for your participation during these meetings. Uh, conversations like this are designed to continue to inform the roadmap uh, for EW expansion and innovations um, going all the way to next year, 2022, 2023. Um, and, you know, what, specifically what's going to be informed is the milestones, our goals, our metrics 
um, and ultimately you know, the future business plan when we submit it in 2023. So thank you all so much. Um, you are going to hear some exciting um, updates from the system operations side. You know, we, we're up to 871 uh, contributing stations. And, and let me tell you, that's, you know, every single month we, we continue on that progress to um, find, you know, finally get to that magic number of 1,115. Uh, we are going to get a little bit of an update on our research and development um, work work group, um, particularly on some of the enhancements and some of our previous uh, projects that we um, that we have funded here um, at Cal OVS, um, um, uh, as well as a little bit on the home base feature, which the, the advisory board has been previously briefed upon, but it has now rolled out and it is active um, uh, in everybody's app right now. Uh, we are going to get an um, exciting update um, on the finance front um, for Earthquake Warning California and the California Earthquake Early Warning System. Um, we'll talk about current year and as well um, uh, on um, uh, next year's budget, which would be the 22-23 um, uh, budget year. Last but not least, um, our education and outreach has um, really, really um, kicked it up a notch. Um, we will be briefing out on uh, some of the efforts that uh, that we took um, during the earthquake preparedness month of April um, and some of the partnership engagements that we had, um, some of the um, the really good media coverage that, that our preparedness tour um, um, received. Um, um, we were very, very excited. Um, we, we saw some real tangible results from that. Uh, you'll also be seeing a little bit of um, some of our efforts um, as it relates to, uh, you know, industry engagement um, and end user enlistment. So um, really kind of sets the, the groundwork for us to to um, kind of um, focus on the overall uh, objective here, which includes, you know, advancing the earthquake early warning technology in California. Um, so that concludes the general program update. Uh, please note that we will be saving, once again, the public comment uh, until after the system operations and research and development um, uh, sections. So let me make sure, excellent. Uh, with that being said, we're going to move right along into the system up operations updates, um, and I will be providing the programmatic updates for the first half, but um, we are going to be joined by uh, our Cal OES partner, Dr. Jennifer Strauss, for the MyShake app. Um, she is the product manager and will follow me um, and provide updates on the current status of um, MyShake. I'm sorry, UC Berkeley. <laughs> Apologies. Um, <clears throat> Okay, make sure that. Excellent. So, as I already mentioned previously, the California Earthquake Early Warning System um, network of contributing stations has increased to 871 out of the uh, 1,115 stations that have been identified. That's an increase of 28 stations since we last met. Um, and you know, obviously, that's that's kind of like the 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 end game for um, for at least this for the system operations work group. Uh, Cal OES and our partners um, have completed uh, 399 out of the 702 planned and funded um, EEW stations, um, an increase of 45 stations since October 2021. Uh, there are a, re uh, a remaining 303 stations pending completion. Um, our partners at um, Public Safety Communications continue to work to connect more EW seismic stations into the state microwave network uh, and to further secure tower and vault leases. There are an additional 11, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 11 EW stations online and connected to the state microwave system for a total of 63 um, out of the 330 stations with 267 remaining. Um, there are an additional 11 PSC tower vault leases that have been completed, um, and we are up to 28 um, out of the 76 leases that have been identified. Touching on a little bit uh, on Q's 21-22, we um, system ops was um, uh, allocated about $12.3 million um, for the 21-22 build down. 
This funding in particular includes station builds and updates, um, but also software modernization and equipment purchases. Um, uh, the funding will uh, sunset in April 2024 um, and will include um, the proposed 53 new stations as part of this particular fiscal year, 40 proposed real-time stations, 10 updated stations, 12 rebuilt stations, and 20 upgraded stations. And of course, um, you know, we always want to talk a little bit of the challenges that, um, um, that, that, we, that we have been dealing with in previous meetings. And again, today, um, you will hear or you, you will hear from me that permitting is still one of those areas that have slowed down the station builds. Uh, therefore, to deal with this, Cal OES uh, recently established a permitting work group to coordinate resources um, to set priorities, uh, system priorities, um, and really to inform decision making um, and streamline processes uh, to really kind of expand our outreach to further identify, scout, um, and execute permits uh, for the installation of approximately 122 federal and state funded uh, seismic stations by June, 2024. The task force is comprised of some of our partners, which include USGS, uh, Menlo Park and Pasadena, uh, UC Berkeley uh, Seism Seismo Lab, Seismo Lab um, Department of General Services, and of course, Cal OBS. Uh, this group will be meeting on a monthly um, basis to collaborate um, on the permitting difficulties and you know share best practices um, between um, all the agencies and, and enlist assistance um, from each other if need be. Uh, next on the agenda, we do have uh, Dr. Jennifer Strauss, um, MyShake app uh, product manager, providing us a quick update on the MyShake app. But before that, did you, do you have anything, Chief Deputy? Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. To talk in real and welcome any comments from the advisor. I just wanted to, to uh, this is Tina again. I just wanted to to comment briefly on the build out. So a lot of numbers <laughs> that were just, um, but you know, good good news in you know things are moving in a positive direction considering all the challenges, especially with COVID and supply chain that's kind of messed up uh, you know a lot of things and in society or slowed things down. Um, the all the stations are funded, which is which is fantastic. So while not all complete, there's a pathway at least financially to meet the goal of what we know the saturation needs to be for California. The one area, and, and I just want to punctuate with Jose, is that that because as you can imagine, and and you know all of you in some way or another, you know work on land use kind of stuff, so you know how complicated this can be. The the team knows where the location needs to be that's optimal. Um, so that could be a private landowner, right? It could be federal government, it could be state government, um, our public safety communications team who's kind of attaching all of this um, to the state microwave network that gives us some you know, good backbone for, um, for the, the, the delivery of the signal. You know, those are shared lease sites where you've got multiple state agencies kind of bolted onto, you know, to one tower. So it gets really complicated really fast. So I appreciate the team, you know, coming together to at least realize as many efficiencies as we can in this permitting one because it seems to persist. Um, the hardest ones, I would imagine, you saved for last um, because that's just, you know, we 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 not, we uh, ticked off the the easier ones first. But I think as a as a board. You know, if there are any you know creative solutions out there that come to mind that we haven't explored, um, you know, please let us know because we realize that you know you all work in this space in your similar space in terms of communications or technology or you know dealing with um, with land use and um, you know this is an area that will you know we'll we'll push and we'll continue to push. But um, COVID and equipment delivery, I want to say, will you know we'll catch up and those will be behind us. But the permitting one seems to be one that um, will probably just get more complicated as we proceed. And, and uh, so this is the time to rally as much as we can on solutions. So thanks in advance for any thoughts you have on that. Um, idea of like, there are locations. Oh, sorry. Are there any locations within properties owned by our departments, agencies? 
Yes, certainly. Um, I, I do believe that there are some stations that are still um, outstanding that, that we could definitely use some help with on the natural resources side. Okay. Um, and we can definitely team with you, you know, um, offline to kind of ident clearly identify because obviously, we, you know, it'll be, it would be too many if we had to identify, but um, I appreciate you making the offer. Sure. I had another similar question. So all of the sites have been ID'd or do you need new, any new targeted? That is correct. I think, and you guys will correct me if I'm wrong. So it's, there's some flexibility to kind of move it slightly, right? If like, if like, you know, the state property's here and the private property's here and we get, but there's a, there's a, you know, certain very, very precise like distance, they have to be around one another. So it's not as simple as, um, you know, let's, let's um, cite it in, in Jeff's area because it's easier. Um, we might be able to do that, but then you might mess up that triangle. Jen's nodding. All right. Yeah. I got, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the density of the stations is set by how the physics of earthquakes work. And so uh, the, the 10 kilometers in urban areas and around fault zones is really so that you have four stations lighting up at the same time as soon as the waves hit the surface. So you have a little bit of fudge room, like Tina said, like a kilometer or two, but, but we're not trying to hit a target like number of stations all clumped in like one area of California and we're success. We're trying to get good coverage everywhere. And, and I would add that Southern California is more densely built out than Northern California yeah. is at this point. So a lot of our focus um, with the permits and the site um, uh, assessments has been Northern California. Copy that. Um, thank you. Um, Lori, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I know I've told this to the team, but I want to offer it a, a, again. If there's any, um, are there are any sites that are on Caltrans property, please, you know, just send those to me and I will work with y'all to get it through our permitting process. Excellent. Thanks so much, Lori Pepper. Um, we will make note of that, um, and we appreciate your willingness to assist. I wanted to open it up to see if there was any other advisory board members that had any comments, um, either in the room or virtually. In that case, we will turn it over to Dr. Strauss for um, her part of the system ops uh, uh, briefing. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thanks for inviting me to speak at the advisory board meeting. It's always great to see everybody here and now in person. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so I'm here representing the MyShake app, um, which is funded by the California Office of Emergency Services as part of the Q's system and is powered by the Shake Alert Earthquake Early Warning System. So the MyShake app is a dual purpose app. Um, our main goal is to provide earthquake early warning alert delivery to the citizens of California who have downloaded the app. We also have a research aspect of the app that is a citizen science effort to use the accelerometers on cell phones to monitor for earthquake motions. Um, I will talk about the former part in the operations section today, and then I'm going to talk about the latter piece during the R&D section. Before I get too far into discussion, I would like to thank my team that is working hard to make sure everything works well and is up and running 24 seven. So these are the people that make the MyShake app possible. So our systems operations update for um, this time is to share that we've had 52 alerts go through the system with 51 actual alerts being sent out since we began operations in October 2019. All of those alerts are for estimated earthquakes of magnitude four and a half and above, and they are sent to phones targeted in the mag uh, MMI three zone, which is basically low to heavy shaking. We have had 185,000 devices alerted overall across those 52 events. Um, some of them have been as large as 45,000 people at a time. Some of them has been as small as like four devices because it was in a very um, unpopulated area of the state. The largest alert that we have sent so far was for the magnitude 5.9 Walker Lake 
quake that was in July of 2021. Um, and then we also have uh, the magnitude 5.9 Fortuna quake, which was in March of 2020. Both of those tied for first place. Um, the largest alert in terms of phones was the magnitude 5.8 Lone Pine event that was in June of 2020. And that was sent to over 47,000 devices at one time. So that's basically what we've been working at and, and keep those alerts flowing as they come in. On this map, um, we're trying to show coverage area. A lot of times people think about earthquakes only happening in Los Angeles and only happening where Loma Prieta happened and that the rest of the state doesn't get earthquakes that much. Well, when you're talking about magnitude four and a half earthquakes, not huge magnitude ones, but, but ones that could potentially cause damage or injuries, there's actually pretty good coverage across the entire state. So if you look at the left-hand map, it shows um, small dots representing um, populations. And then the dots are color-coded based on the shaking intensity that was estimated for that event. And the shaking intensity obviously goes from about three, and then we capped it off at, at five, just to give a good uh, color spread to the map. And so you can see the map is pretty much color coded uh, for most of the population areas of the state, all up and down, um, north to south, east to west. Um, if you look at the right hand map, might be a little confusing to get two maps with two different colors, but the right hand map shows the actual uh, ground shaking after the event that everything has been um, processed and given a actual verifiable earthquake magnitude. You have to remember that for the, the Qs slash shake alert system, these are really fast estimates that are being done with very, very little data. And it's really a testament to the teams that work on that, that, that we get this close in sort of sub-second amounts of data. Um, but yeah, most of the, most of the uh, state is covered. So, so you too in your area, you know, should think about earthquake safety and earthquake preparedness. The final slide that I have for this section is showing an example of our latency. Um, we put in a couple of tags and flags on the phones to try to get information back as to how quickly we are sending these alerts out. So as an example, the magnitude 4.5 El Monte quake, um, which happened back in 2020, was in the Los Angeles area, and we hit a good amount of phones, about 20,000 phones. As you can see from the phones we got information back from, 20% of the phones received the alert in about 1.3 seconds, 50% of the phones in 1.8 seconds, and 80% of the phones got the alert within 2.6 seconds of when ShakeAlert posted the alert message. And so this is very important to show that we are um, able to deliver these alerts at scale to people when it, it matters most. Um, one thing that I like to note about the app, I know there might have been a few questions about um, how we safeguard people's uh, security and privacy. The app is run through CryptoWire before every app release. Because it is available globally and not just through the state of California, it also conforms to the GDPR privacy levels. And so it is an approved sanctioned app on both the um, Google and um, Apple Play stores. We have a very extensive privacy policy that goes into all of the nitty gritty of what we do collect, what we don't collect, and where that is stored. Um, Jessica was very nice to print out hard copies of that for everyone. So if you're interested, I have a stack over there, but I'm also happy to answer any questions or it's available on our website at myshake.berkeley.edu. Um, that's what I have for operations and I will see you again in R&D unless you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Strauss. Um, real quick, um, as mentioned, uh, public comment will be open after we hear updates from both system ops and research and development, which is up next. Um, at the time, if you do wish to make a statement, by all means, please let us know in the room or in the chat feature in Zoom, um, um, and with the moderator will unmute you. But before we go there, is there any questions from the advisory board? 
Brian? I just had a question. Um, this is great um, to see so many people were contacted and I was just wondering, do we have any um, evidence, any anecdotal evidence or else that would show like because of this alert, I was able to run out of the house where I was standing, there was a huge bookcase that smashed to the ground and it saved my life. Um, so or yes and no, I, yeah, <laughs> I, we have not gotten anything quite that dramatic, but um, we do have a Twitter page and an email, um, well, an email that we get uh, feedback from, from different users. So after all um, quakes in large population areas in particular that uh, we see that we do crawl Twitter and see people saying, oh, I got an alert right before the shaking happened, or hey, I got out of the way of a book that was about to fall in my head. Um, so, so no massive furniture movings, but little, little tiny things uh, we have seen evidence of. I think, I think I recall in the Portola quake, there was somebody who had a large following on um, social media that posted something and had was in the car actually and pulled oh over. Yeah, that, yeah 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 i think so you're I right think, uh, we can find that and share that it was yeah, i think it'll be things like that that if we're able to share those on social media and that we're able to amplify it those are the type of things that will really get people downloading it and realizing yes yeah, totally agree totally agree thanks all right, we're gonna to go to the next, I'm sorry, before I move on, is there any other advisory board members virtual or in the room that have any comments or questions? All right, we'll move on to the next slide, please. For our next topic, uh, we're gonna continue on into research and development updates with Dr. Strauss. So she's just gonna stay there and advance her own slides to, to the next, uh, to, to the next uh, presentation. Okay, here's another title slide. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm with the MyShake app. <laughs> In case you are joining us midway. So as I said, the um, the MyShake app is the um, alerting app. We are a licensed operator for the uh, Shake Alert system and the app for the Cues system for the people of California to receive alerts. But we also have a research aspect to the app that's monitoring the accelerometers on phones to see what we can do sort of in the future. And this was really important and we're very thankful that Cal OES saw the importance of funding, not only the alerting side of the house, but the research side of the house, because as we know with the system as a whole, funding fundamental research is how we got here in the first place. So the only way that we're going to be able to push forward into the next generation of capabilities is keeping that side uh, really strong. Um, for those of you who don't know, your phones have a sensor in them that's called an accelerometer. So when you're watching like a movie or something on your phone and you start it in vertical mode and then you turn your phone and it automatically knows to go into horizontal mode, that's the accelerometer. It knows which way gravity is and it knows which way the phone uh, motion is going. And so we're harnessing that sensor to measure earthquakes. So every time that there is a earthquake early warning that is sent out over my shake, we also send a trigger to record the motion on that sensor. And when we get those waveforms back from some phones, we can make really cool plots like the one I'm about to show you right now. So here we see a very scientific plot, but I'm gonna walk you through it. On the x-axis, we have distance. So distance from the epicenter. Where is the center of the earthquake at zero kilometers? And how far away was that phone from the epicenter? On the vertical side, you can see the um, time of the S-wave arrival. So to jog your memory, an earthquake starts there's a first wave front that arrives the fastest, which is called the primary wave. It's a compression wave, kind of comes up below your feet. The second wave front is the secondary wave because we're very creative in naming these things. And that's a transverse wave. That's the thing that goes side to side. If you think about people and buildings, we're really good at dealing with vertical forces, right? I can jump up and down. I deal with gravity. Buildings and people are really bad at dealing with horizontal forces. If I pull a rug out from under you, you're going to fall. 
And so it's traditionally the S wave that we think of as being the most damaging aspect of an earthquake as it's coming. So we use that as sort of our time thing. If we get that alert to you before the S wave comes, you can take protective action to drop cover and hold on. If we get the alert to you after the S wave arrives, you should still take protective action and drop cover and hold on because it's still the correct thing to do to make sure you're at optimal safety. But even a late alert is gonna give you that um, sort of cognitive association that the thing that you're experiencing is an earthquake. So you can remember your training to drop cover and hold on. So in here, we have a nice horizontal line at the zero mark, which means that is when the S wave arrived at that device. And so you can see that we have purple dots and we have some green dots. And all of the green dots are above that line and all the purple dots are below that line. And so the purple dots indicate that the alert arrived with or after the S wave. So those people were ingesting the alert as a safety reminder to drop cover and hold on. It was not a please take protective action soon. It's you're already being affected. However, the green dots, 56% of the people got the alert before the S wave arrived at their location. So they could already begin the drop cover hold on process before the waves get to them. And if you have listened to Earthquake Country Alliance, if you have done your shakeout drills every year, you know that drop is the most important part of drop cover and hold on. And drop is the thing that you can do right away and doesn't take a whole lot of time. And so it's really great to have this sort of data that can really confirm these arrival times in a really diagnostic way and show the success of the system. The second thing that I would like to talk to you about R&D doesn't really have to do with the sensor per se, but it has to do with responding to customer requests. Um, so we take customer feedback very seriously. We try to make sure that everyone is comfortable with the app. Um, some people were not comfortable sharing their location services so that we could be sure to know if they were in harm's way. Um, so we created something called Homebase. Homebase uses the fact that MyShake operates using the military grid reference system. The military grid reference system basically chops up the globe into a bunch of different size squares. And each one of those squares has an ID tag. And so to preserve people's privacy, we were we were not using detailed location services for, for daily monitoring. We were identifying people in these squares anyways. We just know you're in the square. We have no idea where. We're not like tracking you in some kind of crazy database. But we're identifying this square has people in it and we're alerting this square. So we took that idea and just kind of ran with it and said, well, maybe we can give people the opportunity to just identify what square they're in and not even turn location services on at all. Um, and so we implemented that these past eight months and it's working very well. And people are able to set their location and get their square. Um, user feedback has been very positive so far with the exception of many, many people would like to set multiple home base locations, which is not really sensible or workable. Um, because you're going to get an alert for all of those home bases, uh, no matter where you are. And so we have been limiting people to just be able to choose one location. Um, we do hope for the citizen science aspect and the research aspect that people will continue to share their location services with us. We only use precise locations when we are recording an actual earthquake event. Otherwise, we are only assigning people's locations to these squares. Um, so we're hoping that we still have a lot of participants who continue to use our normal service so that we can make the system better. Um, the final thing that I want to mention is future projects that we're working on on the research side of things. We have two papers that are coming out soon. Um, the first one is really looking at 
the information that I presented to you in the operations section, so looking at the latency delivery and how we're serving up alerts um, for the users. The second paper is written by a previous postdoc of ours named Ching Kai Kong, and it's using crowdsourcing of the felt reports that people can report after an event and um, comparing them to other avenues of felt reporting as well as crown truth observations of shaking. So that's a really interesting paper that will be coming out soon. This year, we're going to be working with Cal OES to provide additional language support for the app. It is currently available in both Spanish and English, but we are looking at ways to include Chinese, Korean, Tagalog, and Vietnamese to the language offerings as well. And finally, with the research project, we are continuing to push forward on what is possible with this sort of data. And one of the things that we're looking at is using waveform data to validate the alerting area. Most of the time when you look at your shake maps and you're looking at the uh, intensity distributions, those are done as a combination of actual um, sensor recordings and did you feel it responses. Um, and my shake has a really interesting way of measuring shaking, like where people are. Like you could be in the fifth story of the building and you have your phone on you. And you're probably going to experience shaking in a very different way than somebody sitting on uh, bedrock somewhere on the ground floor. And so we're looking at the shaking intensities that are actually recorded on the devices and seeing what can be said about the urban area. And I believe that is my last slide. And so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, Dr. Strauss. Um, we'll first of all start with, um, um, uh, do any board members wish to ask a question or provide comment in the room or virtually? Um, if you are online, please indicate in the chat feature and the moderator will unmute you. Jose, just a quick question for me. Uh, this is Jeff Tony for those on Zoom. Uh, with the home base uh, program, so those are folks that just don't want to be tracked with location services. Was that the impetus behind it, or? Yeah, there, there's actually two purposes. The first is for people who don't feel comfortable sharing their locations anytime, but the secondary purpose is for people who move about quite a bit, and they may go into areas where their location services are not linking up. They may be living in a rural area where they don't have very good internet connectivity. And so if they have a default location that is set, that even if their location services go in and out a bit and we have stale locations for them, that they'll still get an alert. Excellent. I do believe that we have um, a question on the on the chat, Adam. Thank you, appreciate it. And Jen, nice work, making a ton of progress. And you might've covered this, but um, maybe I missed it. On the purple dots um, back on the slide title, alert arrivals, kind of curious, how are we set up to assess the purple dots from a problem solving standpoint? Do we have a team that does root calls, assessments or parent calls, evaluations to determine what improvements we can make to try to get to batting a thousand percent? I think that's, what we're going for right um so technically we are not going for a hundred percent because um the physics of the earthquakes itself make it impossible to alert people that are standing right on top of the earthquake so the way earthquake early warning works is that an earthquake starts about seven to nine kilometers below the surface of the earth that earthquake has to reach the surface of the earth and be recorded by seismometers that are around the area, which is why from the operation section, having good density of your seismic network is very important. There are four sensors that have to trigger in order for an event to be declared. Then the shake alert system uses a little bit of time from the earthquake data that is logged on the sensors to then run algorithms to determine how big the earthquake is, where it is. Then it goes through a system that correlates data together from any different algorithms that are running. It takes that information and it packages it up into a series of XML files. Those XML files are then sent out to 
users like us um, that redistribute the alerts. So that process in general can take, you know, five seconds. So you, on this plot, you know, you, the, the earthquake has already moved out five seconds before we even get the alert zero on this plot. And so if somebody's standing right at the epicenter, there, there's, yeah. there's literally no way for, for shake alert or my shake or cues to, to get that alert to them. But the Got idea it. is that once you move out, we try to um, have the system go as quickly as possible. There are ways that we're looking at to try to speed up what little that we can, um, but there's, no, there. there's, all, little, all really there's not much wiggle room there. All, be no, all fair, all fair points and very, very helpful. It really it helps my understanding of it. But if you just take the same distance from the epicenter and just go straight up, I mean, you're going to have what the numbers show, 56% and 44% effectively. And so I'm just curious if we're learning from the purple dots. And if we do have a target, maybe it's not 100%, not going to bat 1,000. That's fine. Just curious if we have a target that we want to achieve, whatever it is, 60%, 70%. And if we're assessing that gap to target. And if we have a similar distance from the epicenter, are we looking at the ones that didn't get notified to determine why not to learn from it to see if we can improve the system? That's my main question is on the continuous learning process. Yeah, no, those are really, really great questions. So the system itself has a target of uh, alerting users in less than five seconds. Um, obviously, we we want to do as best as we can. So that's sort of a, you know, a good goal to to assess. So we really look at it in terms of the time domain and not the distance domain, because that's what we have control over. So we have learned over the years that we have sharded our system. We believe that's what we reported on in October to speed things up on our end. Um, we're employing various uh, monitoring ways so that we are aware of what sort of people are having alerts and what sort of people are not having alerts. Um, and we're trying to find ways to shave off those seconds um, that we can. Okay, thank you. I'll type in the chat kind of my suggestion and we can have it as a takeaway. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the your where, where you're going, Michael. And and obviously we want more things in the green bucket closer to the left, right? More less distance between um this is the today technology, but we're imagining a future where where you know we we things just get better and faster and we'll we'll have both um the trifecta of reliability, accuracy, and speed that come together. So that's absolutely the the goal. And I think as we, you know, kind of start to broach into the business and industry adopting that, then we're talking about, you know, business decisions being made on this technology. So we understand that, you know, all those things, including speed, are critical, not just for the public, obviously for life safety, but also for, for decision making that's going to happen, you know, hopefully in an automated way. And so, um, you know, really being clear about what's possible today and, and kind of our commitment to continue to improve is going to be really important to that dialogue. So I, I just appreciate you bringing that up because, um, you know, nothing's ever going to be 100%. That's why this is one of the tools in the toolbox for earthquake safety. But, you know, our goal is to imagine a future where we, you know, technology usually gets better, haven't have yet to see it get worse, um, that, you know, sort of harnesses the latest and, and uh, all of this is great. And I just appreciate Jen and Berkeley because they designed this in a way to get feedback. Every phone that gets pinged gets a ping back, right? So we so we know what happened, which is fantastic. We're not just relying on on um, you know people kind of reporting. Um, so so this data is has been just hugely valuable for us to just kind of see see how it's working and and uh, it, and then to continue to learn and evolve from that. Yeah. And just to add, you know, we, we do take that very seriously and we don't only wait for these events to happen to do that sort of analysis. We have a daily test that is run every single day at 11. It's a silent test, so the users don't see it happening. But we, we test the system and we measure the latency for every single day of the year since October of 2019. Um, and so we are we're we're collecting a lot of data to try to to try to, as Tina said, um, do as best as we can to get those um, that bar a little bit down. 
Excellent. I think we do have a question online. Uh, Lori Pepper, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thanks so much for this presentation, Dr. Strauss. I think, you know, it's amazing since uh, the app was first launched, launched how far it's come. Um, and of course, it's it's still evolving and growing. Um, but it just, I do want to acknowledge um, just the incredible um, work that you and the team have done to date. I wanted to make sure I haven't, I didn't miss anything in your uh, presentation. Um, when you were talking about, um, you know, uh, just that some people don't want to be tracked and having the home base option. Um, I assume that when you're looking at kind of just the, the long term storage of the data points, you're only keeping the location, you're not keeping the location attached to a phone number attached to a user profile. Correct. So the way the MyShake app works is we actually do not require a user profile or any registration information. The phone is only logged on our back end as an ID number, and it's like ZYX263, like yeah, 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 like this big number that doesn't doesn't mean anything about about anything. It's just a, it's just a token number. And so um, if you were to, you know, have a phone and get rid of that phone and you buy a new phone and you install MyShake on it, you'd be a totally different phone, totally different device. Um, the other thing is the locations that we use to alert um, people are stored in the Amazon cloud um, only for two weeks. It's a two week cache. The home base ID tags are, are stored for longer because that's a default, but any uh, transitive, transient location that we get from you is only valid for two weeks and then it is scrubbed and not stored anywhere. Um, the only time we store precise locations again is for specific earthquake monitoring like this one and it is stored as a time series data five minutes of waveform recordings and again it's in a database with uh, just that random ID number, which for you know these purposes, if somebody was trying to you know find this Python code that's been stripped anyways, we just care about the lat longs. Um, so there's no PII personally identifiable information stored anywhere. You'll notice in the app that Homebase asks you for an address, but we don't get that. It's only used on your phone to do a lookup table on your phone to assign it to a square. So again, we don't. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even, we've actually had people ask us to like, you know, delete their profile for the app. And I'm like, I legitimately don't even know who you are. I have no way to associate you with anything on the back end. Um, Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do believe we have one comment on the chat. Um, um, I, I'll read it out loud for everybody. Uh, one of, this is coming from Adam um, um, from pg and &E. Uh, one of my suggestions would be to orient um, this against our targets, and this meaning the, our targets, um, either time or distance and percent notifications we want to achieve and measure performance against that. My experience has shown that improvement happens when we have a target, whatever the appropriate targets are in this case, measure performance against that target, identify when there's a gap to that target, and then identify the drivers for the gap and problem solve to close them. Might be useful to have a few views of this along with any high level catchback actions. Thanks. So we'll make a note of that, Adam, um, and kind of take it, you know, go back to the lab and see if there's anything we, we can do to, to kind of um, um, plan against that. I will also like to, um, uh, to welcome the speaker of the assembly appointee, uh, Lupita Sanchez Cornejo, um, who is representing the interest of private businesses. Um, I do believe that Amina has a question as well. Amina? Um, hi, Dr. Jen. Um, my question, just to um, clarify, when someone has location services turned on, um, you're, the app basically uses kind of like geofencing to like notify them wherever they are, if they're in LA or they're in San Francisco of, you know, an impending earthquake. If they have it turned off, then they're only notifying if they're in that little square. Is that accurate? Yes. 
Um, and it's not precise location services that is used. Um, it's only the sort of smear, smeared out into the, the MGRS square. So yes, if we, if we have a current location for you, we are going to you know, alert you based on that location. If you have a home base set, we are also going to alert you at that home base location. So if they both happen to be the same location, you will get one alert. If they happen to be separate locations, whichever one is in harm's way, we'll get the alert. Got it. Okay, thank you. At this point, um, public comment is now open. If you wish to make a statement, please let us know in the room. If you are online, please indicate in the chat feature and the moderator will unmute you. Hearing none, we'll move on to our next presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Strauss. Next to present is uh, Lori Najura, uh, Deputy Director, Planning, Preparedness, and Prevention Directorate, and she will be discussing our finance updates uh, for current and budget year. Lori? Thank you. And I wanted to make two points of clarification for our new members and um, those designees who maybe this is their first or second meeting. So you've heard the term cues, and um, the, the system uh, from Canada down to uh, the Mexico border, that's the shake alert system. Here in California, statutorily, it's referred to as the California Earthquake Early Warning System, and we um, and it's powered by shake alert. And so we colloquially call it CUES, the acronym C-E-E-W-S. So if you hear CUES, that's what we're talking about. The other thing, as we uh, advance to the next slide, I wanted to talk um, to our board members who may be from non-state agencies and are not familiar with the budgeting process. It's already been alluded to. So in any given year, we'll have a budget act that appropriates funding for the system. And we have one year to encumber it, one and a half years to expend, another one and a half to expend and the final half year to close out. So that's why when we say we were appropriated money in 21-22, we have three years um, before that money finishes out. So on that note, let's take a look at the current year, which only has two, two days left in it. And um, this budget that we're working off of today uh, was 17.283 million. It was one time general fund to finish out the build out of the California earthquake early warning system. And it um, included, uh, Jose already mentioned some of the things that were included that we did. Um, so we are already in contract on some new and updated systems, uh, sorry, stations, um, improving telemetry through our PSC project. We're continuing our statewide education and outreach campaign. Um, we've got additional uh, development going on on the MyShake app, as you just heard, and some research and development. Now let's look at the next budget, which is in print. It's awaiting the governor's signature, which will happen today or tomorrow. So um, we've got some exciting news. It includes $17.1 million ongoing general fund to support education, outreach, operations, and research and development. Last year's budget included funding for the remaining station buildouts, as it's already been mentioned. They're all funded, but not all complete. Over the next couple of years, we'll see all of those. So this year in our funding um, pattern, we then transition to more uh, maintenance and outreach and research and development. Additionally, this year with the governor's support, the administration proposed and the legislature agreed to fund fake early warning out of the general fund on an ongoing basis on the principle that alert and warning is a public safety issue and a core government responsibility. So that's, that's exciting, that's new and different. And then with the funding, 
This year also comes a few new positions, including a dedicated public information officer just for earthquake early warning. And uh, in addition to the Budget Act, we have some trailer bill language that is going to require a report next year chronicling our efforts to seek other private and public funding sources or invest. That is just a one time report. So this year, with our funding, we anticipate maintaining the project, continuing statewide and instituting targeted outreach and education, which we'll talk a little bit more about today, concentrating on the adoption of earthquake early warning automated actions among businesses, other services, and finally looking at some R&D projects in radio and television broadcast and other areas to enhance public awareness. Are there any questions? At this point, we'd like to open it up to any board members who who wish to ask a question or provide comment in the room. We'll, we'll start with the chief deputy if she has any. Um, sure. Yeah, I would just I'd like to underscore. I mean, we got our first um, one-time investment in sixteen seventeen. You know, so you, know, you think about the journey in California since then. We've been fortunate to have the legislature and the governor support this. You know, and that is entirely due to the, you know, the promise and the success of, of the system. And now, you know, this pivot, hopefully not final, um, to kind of recognize there's this core, um, you know, government, um, you know, function that, that is important to maintain now that we've introduced it to the public. It's, it's um, you know, that brings consistency, that brings, um, you know, some reliability and stability to always have that that you know the backbone of this be something that the state is continuing to invest in. So you know it's got to be on all the time. Um, those first stations that were installed back in 1617 probably you know <laughs> have to have some more. You know so there's you know there's things that have to be done that you can understand are ongoing. We also recognize there's an investment that is and will continue to be made by everyone else in order to employ this, you know, kind of new, um, if you want to call it risk reduction or mitigation technology as it gets better. So, so there is a balance of, of um, interest that is feeding into this. And, you know, hopefully this, this stability that the, that the ongoing funding will provide, um, which includes staff, you know, to keep, keep working on this, will um, also help with, um, you know, that, um, that, uh, you know, to, to uh, for adopters to see that, you know, the state is serious about continuing this program and we, we know that it provides tremendous, tremendous promise and value um, for earthquake safety. And it will be something that they, they want to employ in many other ways, you know, beyond what we're using it for now um, for employees, for you know, safety, for um, you know, manufacturing, you know, uh, critical infrastructure, all those things um, that that can benefit from from this and other means of delivery in order to to make those those things happen. So um, again, I just want to underscore that 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 we're very proud to have, you know gotten to this moment, and but it's really because of the work that everybody did to you know, bring this to fruition. Certainly in California, I'm not surprised, I don't think any of you are, that we've had 51 alerts um, because earthquakes are very real every day in California. So, um, so again, just um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll have some good news, news for you in a day or two um, when everything's final, but, um, but just really want to acknowledge the juncture in the funding part. Thank you. Do any other board members wish to ask a question or provide comment um, here in the room or virtually? So just a clarifying question. That's fantastic uh, that it's ongoing funding. Is that 17.1 annually on, on appropriations? Yes, that is correct. Okay, fantastic. Excellent, thank you, Phil. Uh, public comment is now open. If you wish to make a statement or ask a question, please let us know in the room. If you are online, please indicate in the chat feature and the moderator will unmute you.
All right, hearing none. Uh, we're going to move on to our next um, presentation, uh, um, which I will be presenting uh, on the goals for EW outreach and education. So give me one second. <clears throat> We first of all, I want to start out by really kind of restating our overarching goal um, within this program, and that real that goal um, can be best summed up by by stating that you know we want to move towards uh, earthquake early warning technology for all Californians, and diversifying the ways in which Californians benefit from earthquake early warning technology, right? And based around this particular overarching goal. We have taken um, steps within program to try to move that needle forward, um, so to speak. In fact, um, one of the ways that we are actively trying to recruit and, and do outreach is by contacting um, leaders of state agencies um, per um, the prior discussion that occurred with this advisory um, board. Um, in fact, we can and report out that um, we have not only um, been able to introduce the EW program to a variety of um, state agencies, um, but also provide them information on EW um, uh, technology and its importance. Um, we've actively tried to seek uh, partnerships uh, for disseminating um, this information and really try to truly explore uh, where automated actions can be effective within each um, and every single industry. So for those that attended the last meeting, you guys will probably remember the fact that we were um, at the precipice of sending out a letter to the cabinet um, um, of the state of California. And we can report that that letter did go out. And in fact, one of those, uh, I'm sorry, um, we did send a the template of that letter to the entire advisory board a few months back. and. These letters um, really were, were done to encourage the downloading of the MyShake app on all state-owned uh, mobile devices. Um, and therefore, they, these letters really kind of affected that, um, that, um, um, that change right within the cabinet secretaries last December. Um, some of the letter recipients went um, beyond um, the request um, that, um, that the director made and provided information to employees um, about EW technology and earthquake safety throughout their intranet, articles, and other means of communication. So really, the letter was, uh, was not just, did not just meet the goal that we originally kind of set out for. It kind of went one step further. Um, we are planning within the program to do a next round of similar letters um, that will go out to constitutional offices and officers um, uh, from Cal OES, uh, from the director's um, office, um, but also to look at appointed executive branch leaders. Um, their purpose will really be to just engage not only the state agencies and, um, um, but also the engage the industry, the stakeholders, and the public through these representatives. That way we can better identify how EW uh, technology can support um, the representatives' regions, um, you know, their stakeholders, their communities. Um, we do hope to engage in more in-person um, outreach events, um, very much like the one that you will hear about later on in this presentation. Um, um, this particular tour that we um, executed, that we that we did um, in April, really kind of. Um, allowed us to go out to the communities and and deliver um, socialization and outreach to the individuals and allowed us to specifically identify and work towards a more equitable outreach strategy um, and really kind of target some of the underserved communities within um, each region. Um, you know, one of the key things is for us to gather, um, you know, more buy-in um, at all levels of government, but eventually, as you have heard um, before, um, particularly industry, private sectors, um, uh, I'm sorry, the private sector and spe specific sectors that we really think are, are um, you know, uh, important for um, for the eventuality, the end game of um, adopting uh, um, EW technology, but also end user enlistment. 
Uh, so we are currently uh, working on prepping uh, what we're calling outreach packages to really kind of present to key sectors, um, those sectors being medical, transportation, and utility sectors. And these are, you know, the starting point. Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to give the impression that these are the only sectors we're working on, but we are going to take a targeted approach at first while we develop the methodology of how best to, to work with each and every single sector, as you guys can imagine, every single sector has nuances. Uh, and we want to make sure that we don't, we don't just do it in a cookie cutter manner, but we do it right. So we are going to be working with some of the associations um, uh, for these sectors to, um, to kind of truly really, um, help to advance that, up, that system uptake um, within California. Now we have seen some successes um, within these particular sectors and industries, now, not just in California, uh, but also Washington and Oregon. Um, and really the goal for us is to kind of, um, you know, launch off of that. We want to expand and build upon these successes. Um, and truly, you know, this aligns us um, uh, with, um, aligns the industries, uh, I should say, with the uh, USGS, um, you know, recently should, uh, released strategic plan that, you know, very much targets the same, um, the, the same folks, right? All the sectors and the private um, sector. At this point in time, <clears throat> um, we'd like to kind of open it up for um, discussion over to um, to the board. And, you know, we have some questions here that kind of will get the conversation going, but, you know, um, what we want to really kind of hear from everybody um, as to, you know, how we can best engage with stakeholders that you may represent or industries that you may represent. Um, we ultimately feel that each board member obviously chosen very, um, very carefully to represent a, a, either a key a sector or stakeholder group. So we'd love to hear, um, 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 you know, any feedback from you all about whether, you know, what should we include, who we should work with, key stakeholder groups, um, how we can collaborate and leverage. So I'll turn it over to, to the board for discussion. On the mic first, Tina. So a couple of, of thoughts as we kind of move into this part of the presentation. So this is, this is, somewhat following a, a script that we anticipated. So we did a analysis that we you know, enlisted a company to do a benefit analysis, I don't know, five, five years ago. And they went through, and this is, this is when it was very much an infancy, infancy uh, program. And they interviewed all kinds of, you know, business, private, public, um, you know, critical infrastructure, you know, different representatives to understand what would it take? You know, what would it take to make the business case for using earthquake early warning, you know, wherever you sit. And the vast majority thought that getting it out to the public and convincing us that the way, the collective us that way on the efficacy of this was, was the best place to start because, you know, it's, it's uh, ever, you know, a lot of people have cell phones, relatively low risk considering we had no warnings for earthquake um, um, before this technology and then could maybe you know, kind of transfer into the employer, um, you know, through using the self, that same cell phone technology that's already available for its employees. And then the more sophisticated operations like automated um, shutoffs and, and, and elevator stopping and, and all those things. So, you know, we approached this as, as a public, public access first for a lot of reasons, including that. So this is really now we're prepared to make this juncture. However, we recognize that there is no one size fits all. Um, you know, first of all, uh, you know, an uh, entity needs to understand that this exists and what the what it can do. And then there's, you know, the, the should I invest in it? What is the thing I'm investing in? Because it might be technology that actually receives a signal and does something that hasn't yet been has, it doesn't yet materialize. And, and each one of you have, who are familiar with art, know what the barriers and opportunities towards that path are, right? So medical is not going to be the same as education. It's not going to be the same as utilities, um, et cetera. So, so we're really, you know, we really want to um, ask for your advice at this point, because while we have the dedicated staff that's going to really focus on this and, and um, kind of to continue 
on Adam's theme, set our ambitious goals for ourselves to, you know, to, to get more sector adoption. We need to understand the nuances of what that pathway is because, because you know best. And obviously we want to start somewhere. Um, transit, we're going to hear about in, in a little bit, um, have a lot of reasons. Um, again, not surprising, was an early adopter um, and, and has been using it for a while, but, but you know, it's, 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 it's at a point where we want to make sure that we're broadening it um, as much as we possibly can uh, beyond the public um, kind of cell phone uptake that we've, you know, been spending, uh, spending a few years on now. And so, you know, this is truly just a, a brainstorming session, but we want to harness your ideas and the, and the, the outcome is we want to set some goals for ourselves and then we'll go to work and we'll work with USGS and, you know, all the CGS and all the partners to figure out then, okay, on the operator, um, you know, side of this, what's that, what's it going to take so that we can help, help um, users realize their goals to employ EEW. So, um, and then we are fortunate to have a budget for this outreach that we define so we can focus that on what the things that are important, you know, if that needs to be tailored to be, you know, and pivot to be more specific to sectors and then we dedicate that bandwidth um, to it um, while we're still doing public outreach, we can do that. So that's, that's the advantage of having the budgetary item for outreach is that we can tailor it to what you um, think you need for your area um, as well as any, you know, recommendations or, or suggestions that you have beyond that. So I just wanted to kind of tee up with that and, um, you know, hopefully have, you know, just a little bit of brainstorming here, but really kind of work with you um, after this meeting to, to really deepen our understanding of, of what that pathway would be, barriers, opportunities, and then come up with some, again, some goals for, for adoption um, to go even farther than, than we have so far. Excellent. At this point, we'll um, we'll be looking for any comments from the advisory board, um, either on the chat um, and or in the room. All right. Excellent. We'll start um, with Jack. Jack. Hi, uh, Jack Anderson here, um, representing the uh, Cal State University system. I uh, one of the things that um, that. I was thinking about, and since our some of our last conversations is, is the, is you know, you, it, it seems like you you've got to kind of tackle this from two ends. More uh, one, a uh, uh, let's say a tactical standpoint, and then more on the strategic standpoint. And it's you know one of the things that's you know with higher ed students, they're very very tech savvy. But what we've been learning about in some of our, especially recently in the last two years with some of the challenges on the campus, the students really like and want face-to-face -face contact. Even though they are tech savvy, they grew up with tech, they do, you know, what we've found is, is with uh, some of the campuses and some of the hybrid situations, they clamor for the face-to-face. -face. So I, I would just encourage you, I mean, there's in the CSU system, there's, you know, nearly a, a half a million uh, students, faculty, and staff. Um, there's a, a big, you know, a pool of of people to for outreach at that. I would, but I, I, you know, it's I think the newsletter blasts and stuff like that that does work. That maybe as an introduction. The other thing I was thinking about, which I think could really dovetail right into your um, what your looking at here is to outreach to maybe um, some synergy uh, with some majors, with some specific majors such as civil engineering or something along those lines where they can actually be your partners on the campus um, and help promote, um, you know, when you have like an engineering, you know, display day or something like that. It's just throwing it out there. But what we're finding is, is that even though that, you know, we're, we're in this high tech mode and and oftentimes virt which is virtual the students really um, more than appreciate and really want the face to face contact anyway that uh, that's about all i wanted to just kind of say on that one 
Excellent. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Lori Pepper. Thank you. Um, so I have a, a few thoughts. Um, the the first one is is thinking about um, you, you know kind of not necessarily from the app adoption, but looking at kind of system integration. Uh, when you're looking at something like transit agencies, and I know we're going to hear from MetroLink, and I'm very excited to hear their presentation. Um, but in in the state, we have hundreds. Um, we've been counting up between like six and 700 transit agencies, they are all independent. Um, and the vast majority of them have, you know, three or four people that work there. So even if your title is general manager, you're driving a bus. So there is no time for business development. There are no resources to hire a procurement attorney. Um, so what we've done through our California Integrated Travel Project is we've tried a different type of procurement strategy where the state will procure the hardware, software, procure, or uh, consulting services. Um, I shouldn't say procure, I should say we set up a master services agreement and all the transit agencies can then purchase through there. So we're relieving as much of the burden from them that we can. And I know it will likely go beyond transit that could take advantage of that, but that is a, a strategy that if, you know, Cal OES and I will offer up the Cal ITP team to help you if you're interested, whatever the hardware or software pieces of this that would need to be integrated for the system to set something up like that. And it might have to be industry by industry. Um, this is something where um, I think we can make it easy to get the technology out there. Um, the other thing I wanted to recommend is looking at um, uh, kind of funding guidelines for all of the different funding programs that we have. Where appropriate, it might be interesting to see and consider um, you know, prioritize scoring and stuff like that. So in order to kind of start those uh, conversations, I would recommend going to some board meetings, commissioner meetings, whatever the appropriate kind of executive meetings might be to start that conversation. Um, obviously within the CalSTA departments, I'm happy to um, put you in touch with the right people at probably Caltrans, the CTC, CHP high speed rail, there are probably opportunities, potential opportunities in there. So those are the things kind of tactically that I would um, say might get you um, kind of the biggest bang for your buck. I know you guys are short on time and staff. So um, wanted to see, was trying to think about how could we make the most progress or make the most opportunity for progress um, with the least amount of work. Thank you so much, Lori Pepper. Um, next, we have Erica Gonzalez. I, I just wanted to uh, kind of comment on the toolkits. I appreciated the customization, um, you know, given the industry and the targeted approaches. I like the tailored messages, and I really appreciated that they were available in seven different languages. I think that um, helps with outreach and making sure that we're kind of targeting and getting the word out. Um, one industry, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's included in the business um, kind of in the big in the business bucket here, but um, it strikes me financial institutions like banks and credit unions, they have, you know, a, a broad um, big, like reach in communities and that may be um, kind of a target for future outreach packages. And, you know, our one of our, the departments we oversee is DFPI. I'm gonna be happy to make that um, connection if helpful. Excellent. Want to turn over to the advisory board members one last time to see if anybody else had any discussion. Okay, Brian. Um, just want to know uh, how are we doing in getting people to actually download the the app? Um, we're talking about where we're going, but but do we know where we are and and what do what what's our goal in getting number of people? So we have over 1.8 million downloads and um, we continue to push that in our outreach and education. And you'll see um, in a moment here, a couple of the events that we specifically have um, targeted 
downloads for the MyShake app. That's one tool in the toolbox. And um, the system integration is kind of, it's the more nebulous and it's um, industries, businesses, services, integrating automated actions like rolling up doors at fire stations or um, flashing lights and PA at schools and things like that. So those again are other tools in the vast toolbox, which is um, education and outreach and, and earthquake early warning. So um, we don't have, we are developing goals with uh, intended met metrics for meeting some of that. Um, we just haven't gotten them solidified yet. Our focus with those goals is going to be to target these particular industries just because they're early adopters of the earthquake early warning technology. Um, but that does not mean that we won't be also reaching out to other sectors to also integrate. Tina? Yeah, I would just add that we did actually set kind of early on when we developed the app, we thought that 4 million downloads was a, was a good target, you know, 10% of the um, uh, the population, and we're below that, you know, at, at 1.8. Um, so, so that's that's still something we're reaching for. However, if you factor in that that um, my, the um, uh, my shake is not the only way that the public is getting getting alerts, because Google, um, as we've talked about before, has has placed it into their operating system. So that just expands. If, you know, if you figure half ish phones are are Google slash Android. I know other, um, you know, San Diego has kind of merged this with their, so um, so I think that we're way beyond that if you kind of factor in all those things, but it was also important for us to sequence this, like it was important for us and for the director and us as OES as kind of the owners of this, of this program that the state family needed to, you know, show a commitment. So, you know, 100, 200,000 employees, you know, that many of them have cell phones that we needed to walk the walk for. So that was very important um, for us. And while that doesn't make giant leads in the numbers, it's important for us to, to demonstrate um, that commitment. And I think if we, you know, if, if, if the entry point to the kind of next broadening is as employers, we take a look at our workforce and who have cell phones and who could download this today, not just for personal, but as a workplace safety, you know, perhaps that's a that's a starting point that's comfortable. Um, you know, as we kind of evolve towards the more sophisticated, and and I think it was Lori that was. I mean, absolutely. I think I think, um, and I know USGS and the partners in the room they they live this every day. You know, I would imagine a question, especially for smaller organizations, is well, just can you just tell me what to buy? You know, I mean, it's not it's they're they're not going to necessarily engineer. Um, something it's there, there's going to be a, a um, an appetite at a certain size of a organization for just a thing that's manufactured that that can be installed. Um, I know that you know, for example, you know, in the fire services and and uh, public safety, you know, the 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 commonly uh, or at least more commonly understood technologies like the the bay doors, elevators. Um, and so accessing and, and outreaching through those sectors like engineers and and um, and people who design those those types of things could be uh, you know a way to to go too. But we also know this has got to be multi pronged all at the same time. But we just want to be thoughtful and sequence it in the right way. But um, certainly um, we know that we can go a lot farther with just even just the, the public uptake um, with the app to to um, you know, to continue to increase the the uptake of that. You know, from the Natural Resources Agency side, um, you know, we have one of the most public facing organizations outside of DMV in state parks, and we'd be glad to there with the director Armando uh, Quintero. And then, you know, as the summer's coming along, it'd be good for, you know, as parks and they get information about parks. We could also share information about have to work out how we do that. And you know, do we have do you guys have posters with QR codes or something like that we could send out? Great suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, this is actually a really good segue for us to be able to uh, watch one of the videos that really kind of highlights um, successful implementations 
within California. So we'll be actually be selecting the Los Angeles Unified School District um, implementation. And it's just a quick 30 second video um, that, you know, really kind of speaks uh, for itself. So I won't, I won't belabor it. We're going to get a set up and it will be through Zoom. Um, I will note that because of the Zoom, it will degrade the video quality. So apologies for that, um, but you'll, you'll still um, get the full benefit of it. And you can go onto the website and see that video and others that we have created for various users of Earthquake Early Warning. Are we we're we're running a little bit behind so we have we're going to show only one video as we know with earthquakes it's a matter of when and not if well we always like to be the gold standard when it comes to safety issues and earthquake early warning is no exception so what earthquake early warning does for us in the schools is it allows us to take a protective action sooner than we would so everybody has an opportunity to drop cover and hold on before the shaking even begins to start and that is going to save lives and prevent injuries So this video kind of really is a, a little bit of a teaser of the bigger project that, that LA Unified has. And really, um, we can call out other projects such as Menlo Park Fire District, District that has automated their bay doors um, upon earthquake early warning alert um, or Cedar sinai Hospital. Or actually, right now, this is a perfect segue um, for us to be able to highlight um, another project within California which is one of the more advanced implementation projects occurring in the state uh, by one of the largest commuter rail systems in the nation. Uh, this project uh, no doubt will lead to lives saved and a more resilient commuter rail system um, for Metrolink. Um, so we'll turn it over to uh, Luis Carrasquero. We're gonna queue up the, um, the PowerPoint and Luis, we will advance on your behalf. Just say next slide. Uh, thank you, Luis. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Just doing a mic check. Can everybody hear me? Copy that. All right, perfect. Um, so yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Luis Carrasquero, Interim Deputy Chief Operating Officer with Metrolink, also known as Southern California Regional Rail Authority. And uh, I'll be presenting our EEW implementation with our positive train control system. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And I'll just start off with this map. Sorry, one, one back, please. Yes. Okay, so Metrolink is the nation's third largest commuter rail system. We are uh, made up uh, and we are governed by five member agencies. So that's San Bernardino County, Ventura County, LA Metro, Orange County, and Riverside County. We operate uh, seven different routes uh, with 62 stations and over 535 route miles. Uh, we are host, uh, in other words, we dispatch, uh, besides our trains, uh, BNSF and Union Pacific freight trains, as well as Amtrak passenger rail service. And we are a tenant on, or in other words, we operate on uh, other railroads territories, which include the BNSF, the Union Pacific, and North County. Uh, our total dispatch or hosted trains is about 325 currently. And as far as our positive train control system, um, we deployed a system wide on, our, on all of our tracks uh, back in 2015, and we completed the deployment across other uh, railroads, uh, partner railroads by the end of 2018. Next slide, please. Metrolink's EEW project um, automates the stopping or slowing of trains by developing uh, what we call the Commuter Railway Seismic Interface, or CRISI, to integrate um, USGS shake alert notifications with our PTC system. So part of the grant and part of the project that we uh, enter was to identify a pilot um, territory, which we identified as a Paris Valley Line subdivision. Uh, there were various reasons for that. It is close to one of uh, the faults in Southern California. It has uh, 
relatively uh, small traffic. You know, we run early in the morning and late in the evening, uh, but not a lot of traffic in between. So we figure it'd be a good uh, test bed as we develop this, tested this, and then we look to expand um, across, of, across our other territories. Um, part of the grant and the project included also updating our earthquake response procedures from, uh, for train operations and field inspections, improving inspections and return to service, prioritizing the inspections based on where the shaking intensity is felt and asset data as opposed to just taking a global radius and epicenter from um, uh, distance from the epicenter. Uh, we would also train our train engineers, our train conductors, our train dispatchers, and our support desk with this new technology. And just some information as we were, uh, this grant was funded by Caltrans uh, Division of Rail and Mass Transportation uh, for $4.87 million. Next slide, please. So how are we leveraging, uh, how, how are we leveraging uh, the shake alert uh, and we're feeding it to our PTC. So we already know that through shake alert, there are sensors throughout California. It's, it is, uh, provides detection for earthquakes. It calculates uh, various information, including magnitude and epicenter, but it also provides uh, the MMI value, which we are leveraging. And we are then uh, receiving that information. We develop this Chrissy application in the middle. So what it does is that it receives this information from shake alert. We established rules for which we would set triggers as to when we alert trains based on the MMI thresholds. And then we would also then build some logic to be able to determine, are there any uh, of our subdivisions, tracks that are impacted by the earthquake? Are there any trains at the moment that need to be alerted? And then provide the necessary alerts to our maintenance of way personnel and our dispatching operations center. Next slide, please. So I'm sure everybody knows this, but I'll just kind of cover this. So, you know, US, USGS Shake Alert is currently available in California and other states besides California. Um, as far as what we're trying to leverage, you know, we have our P waves, the compression waves, which are the first waves to be detected uh, by the sensors before the S waves, which are, you know, the, considered to be uh, stronger shaking or the ones that could cause the, mo the more damage. Um, Shake alert estimates shaking at grid points across the region and then sends a notification to our subscribers. Uh, but the key factor for us that we're trying to you know, address or, or beat is the amount of advanced warning that we send to the train basically varies um, based on factors including proximity to the train, soil, uh, geographical features, and um, se severity of the earthquake. Next slide, please. All right, there's a lot going on in this presentation, but we, we, we try, I'll, I'll try to kind of, I try to encompass the entire system into this one single presentation. So the way um, that this would work is you, you, we have an event, which is the earthquake. Um, then uh, USGS, the sensors um, detect the shaking, the intensity of the earthquake at various uh, locations throughout the state. Shake alert would send that alert to us um, to the Chrissy application that we have built. And then Chrissy does several uh, processing tasks. So one of them is it determines which sensors in the area reported the, the shaking. And then it then cross-references where are our subdivisions. So in that top right picture, the, you know, the black line is the fault. And then the red line is what would be our Metrolink uh, line. So we would know that certain segments of the subdivision are impacted more severely than others. And then based on that, we uh, add on, are there any trains that are operating at the moment that this alert was received, as well as what are the MMI values that we are receiving and what is the appropriate action? So what, what we have on the bottom of the page is the MMI scale and based on analysis and um, trying to not send uh, false alerts to trains, we established different thresholds in which we would send different instructions uh, or alerts to the trains. So um, 
what we determined was that if we were to receive uh, uh, an alert with an MMI value from 3.5 to 4.5, we would send an automatic informational message to the train via PTC, which would just basically alert them saying, hey, an earthquake was detected. If you feel any shaking, notify the operation center. That, that will be the equivalent of a minor earthquake. Or and, But if it's even less than 3.5, then we wouldn't send anything out, which is what we have seen Fortunately, knock on wood, uh, since we've deployed the system. Um, now, if we go into more of a moderate earthquake in which the MMI value is 4.5 to 5.5, then what we will send is a mandatory directive to slow down to restricted speed. So what that is, is it would, the message through PTC would send a message and the system would be able to warn the engineer that they have, um, a certain amount of time to comply to the speed reduction. If the engineer does not comply with the speed reduction for various reasons, they're distracted, they're incapacitated or whatnot, then the purpose and the objective of PTC is that it will apply the brakes automatically without any intervention from the um, train engineer. And we apply the same logic if you have a severe earthquake, if we get an MMI of 5.5 or above, then we will send a mandatory directive to stop. And in, in which case we would, as soon as the this directive is received by the train through the PTC system, it would apply the brakes. The one caveat is that we do also have to take into consideration that we don't wanna stop the train inside tunnels, under overpasses or bridges. So we're constantly monitoring the position of these trains. And when we do get that alert, we know if we're able to apply the brakes immediately or whether we need or whether we need to wait a couple seconds before because the train is in a in a bridge or in an overpass or in a tunnel uh, but the, the, the in a nutshell that's what we have been able to um, develop uh, through our system next slide please so this just this is just uh, kind of reiterate what I was uh, explaining on the different MMI levels and the different actions that we have for the trains from no advisory below 3.5 to then the um, uh, minimal earthquake shaking to moderate to then severe, um, highlighting the no stopping on bridges under overpass system and tunnels into contact operations. Next slide, please. So along with the, the functionality of you know, slowing or stopping trains automatically when an earthquake is felt, we also generate automatic reports that we have to send over to our dispatching operations center as well as our maintenance of weight personnel. So that way they know um, which areas of the rail are impacted, which assets need to be prioritized. And we also include maps. So this is just a snippet of, of kind of what we've been able to build. So the the red dots are the different sensors that we are leveraging for the Paris Valley Line subdivision. The blue line is our track, the Paris Valley Line. Um, the green icons are representations of the different trains that are in the territory at the moment that we receive the shaking. Um, and then we uh, have the ability to generate geofences for uh, grids for the sensors that we're to receive information, as well as the geofences that we're able to prioritize inspections due to the severity or the possible impact on the train. Next slide, please. Okay, so as far as the project status, we were able to, um, you know, develop the system, we were able to develop software, we lab and field tested it, we deployed it. Um, to production to the Paris Valley Line subdivision, the initial version, which was just a notification uh, without an enforceable bulletin. But recently we have successfully been able to deploy what we are calling the final version, which is PTC receiving this information and applying the brakes automatically on the Paris Valley Line subdivision. And our final two bullets is basically, we're now mapping the rest of our subdivisions um, so that way we can um, expand this across across all of our lines and also be able to leverage the lines for which we don't own but our trains operate to still uh, notify or warn engineers if there is an earthquake that is detected in their area that could 
uh, impact their operation. Next slide, please. And that would conclude my presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions. All right, as I'm looking at the time, um, we're obviously a little short on it. Um, we'll give the opportunity for the advisory board to ask any questions um, of Luis, um, but, I, but we, we will have to make a decision as to whether the advisory board will wanna take up the next um, presentation, which would be the education and outreach uh, presentation that we have for everybody. Or we could further, you know, uh, discuss um, not only the system implementation, but also the Metrolink presentation. So I'll defer over to the board for questions or comments. We'll start with questions on, on Metrolink. Hi, it's Tina. Thank you for the presentation. And I may have missed this. How many have you actually um, had some earthquakes where you've employed the crane slowing slash stopping? Uh, luckily, none. Uh, <laughs> um, so to, to kind of put that in, in context, so we have been able to, we have the ability to simulate um, earthquakes. Uh, we have a relationship with USGS and Shake Alert in which we're able to simulate an earthquake with whatever magnitude at whichever location so that we can test that the system is properly receiving alerts and is able to send the necessary alerts but as far as a live non-simulated earthquake luckily we haven't received any that have met a threshold uh, above a 3.5 mmi um, since we've deployed the system Do any board members wish to ask a question or provide comments in the room or virtually? If you're online, please indicate it in the chat feature and the moderator will unmute you. Uh, we want to turn it over to Amina. Amina, I know that you had a comment that, that was related to the system implementation aspect. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm with the, the UC and uh, while of course we big part of what we do is house and educate students, uh, equally big part is research. And so um, I was going to recommend maybe calling research out as its own industry. Obviously, we're not the only ones that do it, but we have a lot of high value research. Um, and some of these mitigation strategies, these applications could be written into grants um, and funded that way. Uh, through the grants and as a way to protect the research. Um, but obviously there's other you know, research entities that could benefit from having their own tool toolkit um, and outreach package. Thank you, Amina, that's a, that's a great point to raise. Any other comments or questions from the board? Public comment is now open. If you wish to make a statement, please let us know in the room. If you are online, please indicate in the chat feature and the moderator will unmute you. Hearing none, I'll turn it back over to the board as to whether we wanna hear the next uh, presentation, education and outreach, um, or if we wish to table that for the next um, board meeting. Um, in you know uh, so that we may be able to further um, discuss system implementation if any of the advisory board members have any further um, comments or points that they would like to raise I'll, I'll just make a suggestion we have three minutes left obviously that's not enough to cover what you were you were um planning to but maybe can you hit Yvonne or whoever you can you do the 30 second um just highlights of what can be expected and then we can maybe follow up with some written um, materials to the board is that okay with everyone okay give us one second while we queue up to discuss thank you <clears throat> Hi hey everyone, um, Yvonne Durantes. I am a Senior Emergency Services Coordinator on the Education and Outreach team. And so in the spirit of highlighting some of our successes from our last meeting to today, we did um, have our April Earthquake Preparedness 
event this year. And so April is California's Earthquake Preparedness Month. And so in the spirit of that, we did host a tour throughout different cities in California. And these cities and events were handpicked by Cal OES and specifically picked due to either high earthquake risk or uh, vulnerable populations. We also targeted um, both English and Spanish media. And we really made it an effort to reach as wide of an audience as possible. And so as you can see on the slide, here are some of our key metrics, which include from that week, over 10,000 MyShake app downloads, an equivalence of 1.1 million in ads. And we also um, you know, were able to do a lot of coordinated messaging and partnerships with our end users. And so I do just want to highlight some of our um, stops. And so we did have in San Diego um, some individuals come who had heard about it in, in the news earlier in the morning. And so we're able to come check out the earthquake simulator, which, which was really the focal point of the tour. And so the earthquake simulator served as a very fun experience for people of all ages to be able to ride it and get a sense for what an earthquake might feel like. And so we were able to um, have students, seniors of all ages. And the reason why the uh, earthquake preparedness event was scheduled during the first week of April was in hopes that families would take advantage of it during the entire earthquake preparedness month and start those conversations of family plans, evacuation routes, what to have in your emergency preparedness kit. And also just so people get a sense of where they live, uh, we were able to talk about different fault lines. Um, we were able to discuss you know, some of their, their hazards in their community. Uh, next slide, please. Something that kind of really struck out to me was in Salinas, um, which um, I'm actually from, and the average household size is approximately 15 people um, in the community of East Salinas, which is where our stop was at. And I had an individual ask me if it was earthquake weather, and that's why we were promoting it. And so I think that really speaks to the importance for these events and to be able to educate individuals on, you know, we have over 10,000 earthquakes in California every year, and we can expect one at any given moment. And so it's really important for everybody to be on the same page and know that the safest thing to do is to drop, cover, and hold, and to really leverage our current day technology, which, you know, is a MyShake app um, that allows us to get those life-saving seconds to, to drop, cover, and hold. And so here are some of the pictures you can see. Um, a, a little kid there kind of enjoying the ride. And uh, we had a system in place in which individuals would ride the simulator and then come by our booth to be able to get additional information and resources. Yeah. And so that's kind of our key highlights. Well, thank you, Yvonne. We do have a um, comment from the chat from Jack Anderson um, out of the California State University system um, that he does believe that the outreach programs on campus will be the most attractive uh, to students uh, representing the, you know, the universities. Um, with that being said, um, uh, Chief Deputy Director, um, would you like any to provide any comments, statements, any um, closing statements? <laughs> No, uh, just kidding. I always do. We're a little over time. Thanks for bearing with us. This was a really um, very helpful, not just the updates from the team, um, just great appreciation for all that you do every day, but also from the board members. You teed up some, some good ideas. Um, keep them flowing to us after this, and we'll definitely be reaching out to you to, to uh, kind of build out this um, roadmap. Uh, for what comes next. And um, I think that we can plan on another meeting in you know, three months-ish um, from now. We'll hope that the, um, that the fires and all the other things that, that happen in our lives are, are um, not as, as daunting as they have been the last couple of years, but we know that things get real busy for, for many of you um, as well over the summer. But, um, but just look forward to your feedback and continued engagement. Um, again, if there's anything um, you can suggest on how we can improve or make this program better, please, please um, let us know. But thanks for your time today. Thank you. 
Uh, do any board members wish to, um, you know, um, uh, do a final comment and or statement? Um, if you are online, please indicate in the chat feature and the moderator will unmute you. Final public comment is now open. Um, all comments will be limited to three minutes per person. If anybody has um, any comment, should you like to comment, please indicate that in the chat function of the video. If you are virtual or if you're in the room, um, feel free to speak up. Seeing nothing, um, thank you all so much. Sorry for running a little late. We are adjourned.